The Magic Pages, Favorite Fairy Tales is a wonderful book compiled and illustrated by the talented artist Peter Newell. It brings together some of the best-known and best-loved fairy tales that have been celebrated for generations. From the majestic Jack battling the giants to the romantic Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty and the enigmatic Little Red Riding Hood, each story appeals with its uniqueness and magic. The book also includes stories of the unattractive but kind Ugly Duckling, the beautiful and terrifying Beauty and the Beast, Princess Snow White and the unusual Red Rose. The fabulous Wild Swans and Ali Baba and his battle with 40 robbers are not forgotten either. But in addition to the well-known stories, the book also includes four others, not as widely known but no less interesting. All these exciting stories, brought to life in the dreams and imagination of children and adults alike, are based on the memories of various famous people who remember them as their most favorite from childhood. Each page of the book is filled with magic, colorful illustrations and unforgettable adventures that allow readers to plunge into a world of fairy tales and fascinating stories, opening boundless expanses of imagination and inspiring faith in magic and goodness. Magic Pages, Favorite Tales, is a true treasure trove of fairy tale magic that will never Chapter cease to fascinate its readers. Favorite Fairy Tales
Chapter 2 of Favourite Fairy Tales Favourite Fairy Tales Cinderella There was once an honest gentleman who took for his second wife a lady, the proudest and most disagreeable in the whole country. She had two daughters exactly like herself in all things. He also had one little girl who resembled her dead mother, the best woman in all the world. Scarcely had the second marriage taken place and the stepmother became jealous of the good qualities of the little girl, who was so great a contrast to her own two daughters. She gave her all the menial occupations of the house, compelled her to wash the floors and staircases, to dust the bedrooms and clean the grates, and while her sisters occupied carpeted chambers hung with mirrors where they could see themselves from head to foot, this poor little damsel was sent to sleep in an attic on an old straw mattress with only one chair and not a looking glass in the room. She suffered all in silence, not daring to complain to her father, who was entirely ruled by his new wife. When her daily work was done, she used to sit down in the chimney corner among the ashes, from which the two sisters gave her the nickname of Cinderella. But Cinderella, however shabbily clad, was handsomer than they were with all their fine clothes. It happened that the king's son gave a series of balls, to which were invited all the rank and fashion of the city, and among the rest, two elder sisters. They were very proud and happy, and occupied their whole time in deciding what they should wear, a source of new trouble to Cinderella, whose duty it was to get up their fine linens and laces, and who could never please them however much she tried. They talked of nothing but their clothes. I, said the elder, shall wear my velvet gown and my trimmings of English lace. And I, added the younger, or have but my ordinary silk petticoat, but I shall adorn it with an upper skirt of flowered brocade, and shall put on my diamond tiara, which is a great deal finer than anything of yours. Here the elder sister grew angry, and dispute began to run so high that Cinderella, who was known to have excellent taste, was called upon to decide between them. She gave them the best advice she could, and gently and submissively ordered to dress them herself, and especially to arrange their hair, an accomplishment in which she excelled many a noted coiffeur. The important evening came and she exercised all her skill to adorn the two young ladies. While she was combing out the elder's hair, this ill-natured girl said sharply, Cinderella, do you not wish you were going to the ball? Ah, madam, they obliged her always to say madam. You are not only mocking me, it is not my fortune to have any such pleasure. You are right, people would only laugh to see a little cinder wench at a ball. Any other than Cinderella would have dressed the hair all array, but she was good and dressed it perfectly even and smooth, and as prettily as she could. The sisters had scarcely eaten for two days, and had broken a dozen stay laces in a day, in trying to make themselves slender, but tonight they broke a dozen more, and lost their tempers over and over again before they had completed their toilette. When at last the happy moment arrived, Cinderella followed them to the coach. After it had whirled them away, she sat down by the kitchen fire, and cried. Immediately her godmother, who was a fairy, appeared beside her. What are you crying for, my little maid? Oh, I wish, I wish, her sobs stopped her. You wish to go to the ball, isn't it so? Cinderella nodded. Well then, be a good girl and you shall go. First run into the garden and fetch me the largest pumpkin you can find. Cinderella did not comprehend what this had to do with her going to the ball, but being obedient and obliging, she went. Her godmother took the pumpkin, and having scooped out all its insides, struck it with her wand. It became a splendid gilt coat lined with rose-coloured satin. Now fetch me the mouse trap out of the pantry, my dear. Cinderella brought it, and it contained six of the fattest, sleekest mice. The fairy lifted up the wire door, and as each mouse ran out, it, she struck it, and changed it into a beautiful black horse. But what shall I do for your coachman, Cinderella? Cinderella suggested that she had seen a large black rat in the rat trap, and he might do for want of better. You are right. Go and look again for him. He was found, and the fairy made him into the most respectable coachman, with the finest whiskers imaginable. She afterwards took six lizards from behind the pumpkin frame and changed them into six footmen, all in splendid livery, who immediately jumped up behind the carriage as if they had been footmen in all their days. Well, Cinderella, now you can go to the ball. What, in these clothes? said Cinderella piteously, looking down on her ragged frock. Her godmother laughed, and touched her also with the wand, at which her wretched threadbare jacket became stiff with gold and sparkling with jewels. Her woollen petticoat lengthened into a gown of sweeping satin, 
from underneath which peeped out her little feet, no longer bare but covered with silk stockings and the prettiest glass slippers in the world. Now, Cinderella, depart, but remember, if you stay one instant after midnight, your carriage will become a pumpkin, your coachman a rat, your horses mice, and your footmen lizards, while you yourself will be a little cinder wench you were an hour ago. Cinderella promised without fear, her heart was so full of joy. Arrived at the palace, the king's son, whom someone, probably the fairy, had told to await the coming of an uninvited princess whom nobody knew, was standing at the entrance ready to receive her. He offered her his hand and led her with the utmost courtesy to the assembled guests, who stood aside to let her pass, whispering to one another, Oh, how beautiful she is! They might have turned the head of anyone but poor Cinderella, who was so used to be despised that she took it all as if it was something happening in a dream. Her triumph was complete. Even the old king said to the queen that never since Her Majesty's young days had he seen so charming and elegant a person. All the court ladies scanned her eagerly, clothes and all, determining to have theirs made the next day of exactly the same pattern. The king's son himself led her out to dance, and she danced so gracefully that he admired her more and more. Indeed, at supper, which was fortunately early, his admiration quite took away his appetite. The Cinderella herself, with an involuntary shyness, she sought out her sisters, placed herself beside them, and offered them all sorts of civil attentions, which, coming as they supposed from a stranger, and so magnificent a lady, almost overwhelmed them with delight. While she was talking with them, she heard the clock strike a quarter to twelve, and making a courteous adieu to the royal family, she re-entered her carriage, escorted tenderly by the king's son, and arrived in safety at her own door. There she found her godmother, who smiled approval, and of whom she begged permission to go to a second ball the following night, to which the Queen had earnestly invited her. While she was talking, the two sisters were heard knocking at the gate, and the fairy godmother vanished, leaving Cinderella sitting in the chimney corner, rubbing her eyes and pretending to be very sleepy. Ah! cried the elder sister, maliciously. It has been the most delightful ball, and there was present the most beautiful princess I ever saw, who was so exceedingly polite to us both. Was she? said Cinderella indifferently. And who might she be? Nobody knows that everybody would give their eyes to know, especially the king's son. Indeed, replied Cinderella, a little more interested. I should like to see her. Miss Javotte, that was the elder sister's name, will you not let me go tomorrow and lend me your yellow gown that you wear on Sundays? What? Lend my yellow gown to a cinder wench? I am not so mad as that. At which refusal Cinderella did not complain, for if her sister really had lent her the gown, she would have been considerably embarrassed. The next night came, and the two young ladies, richly dressed in different toilettes, went to the ball. Cinderella, more splendidly attired and beautiful than ever, followed them shortly after. Now remember, twelve o'clock, was her godmother's parting speech, and she thought she certainly should. But the prince's attention to her were greater than even than the first evening, and in the delight of listening to his pleasant conversation, time slipped unperceived. While she was sitting beside him, in a lovely alcove, and looking at the moon from under a bough of orange blossoms, she heard a clock strike the first stroke of twelve. She started up, and fled away as lightly as a deer. Amazed, the prince followed, but could not catch her. Indeed, he missed his lovely princess altogether, and only saw running out of the palace doors a dirty little lass, whom he had never beheld before and of whom he certainly would never have taken the least notice. Cinderella arrived at home breathless and weary, ragged and cold, without carriage or footman or coachman, the only remnant of her past magnificence being one of her little glass slippers. The other she had dropped in the ballroom as she ran away. When the two sisters returned, they were full of a strange adventure. How the beautiful lady had appeared at the ball more beautiful than ever, and enchanted everyone who looked at her and how as the clock was striking twelve, she had suddenly risen up and fled through the ballroom, disappearing no one knew how or where, and dropping one of her glass slippers behind her in her flight. How the king's son had remained inconsolable until he chanced to pick up the little glass slipper, which he carried away in his pocket, and was seen to take it out continually and look at it affectionately, with the air of a man very much in love. In fact, from his behaviour during the remainder of the evening, all the court and royal family were convinced that he had become desperately enamoured of the wearer of the little glass slipper. Cinderella listened in silence, turning her face to the kitchen fire, and perhaps it was that which made her look so rosy, but nobody ever noticed or admired her at home, and so it did not signify. 
The next morning she went to her weary work again, just as before. A few days after, the whole city was attracted by the sight of a herald going round, with a little glass slipper in his hand, publishing with a flourish of trumpets, that the king's son ordered this to be fitted on the foot of every lady in the kingdom, and that he wished to marry the lady whom it fitted best, or to whom it and the fellow slipper belonged. Princesses, duchesses, countesses, and simple gentlewomen all tried it on, but being a fairy slipper, it fitted nobody. And besides, nobody could produce a fellow slipper, which lay all the time safely in the pocket of Cinderella's old flimsy gown. At last the herald came to the house of the two sisters, and though they well knew neither of them was a beautiful lady, they made every attempt to get their clumsy feet into the glass slipper, but in vain. Let me try it on, said Cinderella from the chimney corner. What, you? cried the others, bursting into shouts of laughter. But Cinderella only smiled and held out her hand. Her sisters could not prevent her, since the command was that every young maiden in the city should try on the glass slipper, in order that no chance might be left untried, for the prince was nearly breaking his heart, and father and mother were afraid that, though a prince, he would actually die for the love of a beautiful unknown lady. So, the herald bade Cinderella sit down on the three-legged stool in the kitchen, and himself put the slipper on her pretty little foot, which it fitted exactly. She then drew from her pocket the fellow slipper, which she also put on, and stood up. For with the touch of magic shoes, all her dress was changed likewise. No longer the poor despised sinned wench, but the beautiful lady whom the king's son loved. Her sisters recognised her at once. Filled with astonishment mingled with no little alarm, they threw themselves at her feet, begged her pardon for all their former unkindness. She raised and embraced them, told them she forgave them with all her heart, and only hoped they would love her always. Then she departed with the herald to the king's palace, and told her whole story to his majesty and the royal family, who were not in the least surprised, for everybody believed in fairies, and everybody longed to have a fairy godmother. For the young prince, he found her more lovely and lovable than ever, and insisted upon marrying her immediately. Cinderella never went home again, but she sent for her two sisters to the palace, and, with the consent of all parties, married them shortly after to two rich gentlemen of the court. End of Cinderella Chapter 2 Chapter 3 A Favourite Fairy Tales Favourite Fairy Tales Jack and the Beanstalk In the days of King Alfred, there lived a poor woman whose cottage was in a remote country village many miles from London. She had been a widow some years, and had an only child named Jack, whom she indulged so much that he never paid the least attention to anything she said, but was indolent, careless, and extravagant. His follies were not owing to a bad disposition, but to his mother's foolish partiality. By degrees he spent all that she had, scarcely anything remained but a cow. One day, for the first time in her life, she reproached him. Cruel, cruel boy, you have at last brought me to beggary. I have not money enough to purchase even a bit of bread. Nothing now remains to sell but my poor cow. I am sorry to part with her. It grieves me sadly, but we cannot starve. For a few minutes Jack felt remorse, but it was soon over, and he began asking his mother to let him sell the cow at the next village, teasing her so much that she at last consented. As he was going along, he met a butcher, who inquired why he was driving the cow from home. Jack replied he was going to sell it. The butcher had some curious beans in his hat. They were of various colors and attracted Jack's attention. This did not pass unnoticed by the man, who, knowing Jack's easy temper, thought now was the time to take an advantage of it and, determined not to let slip so good an opportunity, asked what was the price of the cow, offering at the same time all the beans in his hat for her. The silly boy could not conceal the pleasure he felt at what he supposed so great an offer. The bargain was struck instantly, and the cow exchanged for a few poultry beans. Jack made the best of his way home, calling aloud to his mother before he reached the door thinking to surprise her. When she saw the beans and heard Jack's account, her patience quite forsook her. She tossed the beans out of the window, 
where they fell on the garden bed below. Then she threw her apron over her head and cried bitterly. Jack attempted to console her, but in vain, and, not having anything to eat, they both went supperless to bed. Jack awoke early in the morning, and, seeing something uncommon darkening the window of his bedchamber, ran downstairs into the garden, where he found some of the beans had taken root and sprung up surprisingly. The stalks were of an immense thickness, and had twined together until they formed a ladder like a chain, and so high that the top appeared to be lost in the clouds. Jack was an adventurous lad. He determined to climb up to the top and ran to tell his mother, not doubting but that she would be as much pleased as he was. She declared he should not go, said it would break her heart if he did, entreated and threatened, but all in vain. Jack set out, and after climbing for some hours reached the top of the beanstalk, quite exhausted. Looking around, he found himself in a strange country. It appeared to be a barren desert. Not a tree, shrub, house, or living creature was to be seen. Here and there were scattered fragments of stone, and at unequal distances small heaps of earth were loosely thrown together. Jack seated himself pensively upon a block of stone and thought of his mother. He reflected with sorrow upon his disobedience in climbing the beanstalk against her will, and concluded that he must die of hunger. However, he walked on, hoping to see a house where he might beg something to eat and drink. He did not find it, but he saw at a distance a beautiful lady walking on alone. She was elegantly clad and carried a white wand, at the top of which sat a peacock of pure gold. Jack, who was a gallant fellow, went straight up to her when, with a bewitching smile, she asked him how he came there. He told her all about the beanstalk. The lady answered him by a question, Do you remember your father, young man? No, madam, but I am sure there is some mystery about him, for when I name him to my mother, she always begins to weep and will tell me nothing. She dare not, replied the lady, but I can and will, for no, young man, that I am a fairy and was your father's guardian. But fairies are bound by laws as well as mortals, and by an error of mine I lost my power for a term of years, so that I was unable to succor your father when he most needed it, and he died. Here the fairy looked so sorrowful that Jack's heart warmed to her, and he begged her earnestly to tell him more. I will. Only you must promise to obey me in everything, or you will perish yourself. Jack was brave, and, besides, his fortunes were so bad they could not well be worse, so he promised. The fairy continued, Your father, Jack, was a most excellent, amiable, generous man. He had a good wife, faithful servants, plenty of money, but he had one misfortune. A false friend. This was a giant whom he had succored in misfortune and who returned his kindness by murdering him and seizing on all his property, also making your mother take a solemn oath that she would never tell you anything about your father or he would murder both her and you. Then he turned her off with you in her arms to wander about the wide world as she might. I could not help her, as my powers only returned on the day you went to sell your cow. It was I, added the fairy, who impelled you to take the bean so you made the beanstalk grow and inspired you with the desire to climb up it to this strange country, for it is here the wicked giant lives who was your father's destroyer. It is you who must avenge him and with the world of a monster who never will do anything but evil. I will assist you. You may lawfully take possession of his house and all his riches, for everything he has belonged to your father, and is therefore yours. Now farewell. Do not let your mother know you are acquainted with your father's history, 
This is my command, and if you disobey me, you will suffer for it. Now go. Jack asked where he was to go. Along the direct road, till you see the house where the giant lives. You must then act according to your own just judgment, and I will guide you if any difficulty arises. Farewell. She bestowed on the youth a benignant smile and vanished. Jack pursued his journey. He walked on till after sunset, when to his great joy he espied a large mansion. A plain-looking woman was at the door. He accosted her, begging she would give him a morsel of bread and a night's lodging. She expressed the greatest surprise, and said it was quite uncommon to see a human being in their house, for it was well known that her husband was a powerful giant who would never eat anything but human flesh if he could possibly get it, that he would walk fifty miles to procure it, usually being out the whole day for that purpose. This account greatly terrified Jack, but still he hoped to elude the giant, and therefore he again entreated the woman to take him in for one night only, and hide him where she thought proper. She at last suffered herself to be persuaded, for she was of a compassionate and generous disposition, and took him into the house. First they entered a fine large hall, magnificently furnished. They then passed through several spacious rooms in the same style of grandeur, but all appeared forsaken and desolate. A long gallery came next. It was very dark, just light enough to show that, instead of a wall on one side, there was a grating of iron which parted off a dismal dungeon, for whence issued the groans of those victims whom the cruel giant reserved in confinement for his own voracious appetite. Poor Jack was half dead with fear, and would have given the world to have been with his mother again, for he now began to doubt if he should ever see her more. He even mistrusted the good woman, and thought she had let him into the house for no other purpose than to lock him up among the unfortunate people in the dungeon. However, she bade Jack sit down and gave him plenty to eat and drink, and he, not seeing anything to make him uncomfortable, soon forgot his fear and was just beginning to enjoy himself, when he was startled by a loud knocking at the outer door, which made the whole house shake. Ah, oh, that's the giant, and if he sees you, he will kill you and me too, cried the poor woman trembling all over. What shall I do? Hide me in the oven, cried Jack now as bold as a lion at the thought of being face to face with his father's cruel murderer. So he crept into the oven, for there was no fire near it, and listened to the giant's loud voice and heavy step as he went up and down the kitchen scolding his wife. At last he skated himself at table, and Jack, peeping through a crevice in the oven, was amazed to see what a quantity of food he devoured. It seemed as if he never would have done eating and drinking, but he did at last, and, leaning back, called to his wife in a voice like thunder, Bring me my hen! She obeyed, and placed upon the table a very beautiful live hen. Lay! roared the giant, and the hen laid immediately an egg of solid gold. Lay another! And every time the giant said this, the hen laid a larger egg than before. He amused himself a long time with his hen, and then sent his wife to bed, while he fell asleep by the fireside and snored like a roaring of cannon. As soon as he was asleep, Jack crept out of the oven, seized the hen and ran off with her. He got safely out of the house, and finding his way along the road he came, reached the top of the beanstalk, which he descended in safety. His mother was overjoyed to see him. She thought he had come to some ill end. Not a bit of it, mother. Look here. And he showed her the end. Now lay. And the hen obeyed him as readily as the giant and laid as many golden eggs as he desired. These eggs being sold, Jack and his mother got plenty of money and for some months lived very happily together, till Jack got another great longing to climb the beanstalk, 
and carry away some more of the giant's riches. He had told his mother of his adventure, but had been very careful not to say a word about his father. He thought of his journey again and again, but still he could not summon resolution enough to break it to his mother, being well assured that she would endeavor to prevent his going. However, one day he told her boldly that he must take another journey up the beanstalk. She begged and prayed him not to think of it, and tried all in her power to dissuade him. She told him that the giant's wife would certainly know him again, and that the giant would desire nothing better than to get him into his power, that he might put him to a cruel death. In order to be revenged for the loss of his hen, Jack, finding that all his arguments were useless, ceased speaking, though resolved to go at all events. He had a dress prepared which would disguise him, and something to color his skin. He thought it impossible for anyone to recollect him in this dress. A few mornings after, he rose very early, and unperceived by anyone, climbed the beanstalk a second time. He was greatly fatigued when he reached the top, and very hungry. Having rested some time on one of the stones, he pursued his journey to the giant's mansion, which he reached late in the evening. The woman was at the door as before. Jack addressed her, at the same time telling her a pitiful tale and requesting that she would give him some victuals and drink, and also a night's lodging. She told him, what he knew before very well, about her husband's being a powerful and cruel giant, and also that she had one night admitted a poor, hungry, friendless boy, that the little ungrateful fellow had stolen one of the giant's treasures, and ever since that her husband had been worse than before, using her very cruelly and continually upbraiding her with being the cause of his misfortune. Jack felt sorry for her, but confessed nothing, and did his best to persuade her to admit him, but found it a very hard task. At last she consented, and as she led the way, Jack observed that everything was just as he had found it before. She took him into the kitchen, and after he had done eating and drinking, she hid him in an old lumber closet. The giant returned at the usual time, and walked in so heavily that the house was shaken to its foundation. He seated himself by the fire, and soon after exclaimed, Wife, I smell fresh meat. The wife replied it was the crows which had brought a piece of raw meat and left it at the top of the house. While supper was preparing, the giant was very ill-tempered and impatient, frequently lifting up his hand to strike his wife for not being quick enough. He was also continually upbraiding her with the loss of his wonderful hen. At last, having ended his supper, he cried, Give me something to amuse me, my harp or my money bags. Which will you have, my dear? said the wife humbly. My money bags, because they are the heaviest to carry, thundered he. She brought them, staggering under the weight, two bags, one filled with new guineas and the other with new shillings. She emptied them out on the table, and the giant began counting them in great glee. Now you may go to bed, you old fool. So the wife crept away. Jack, from his hiding place, watched the counting of the money, which he knew was his poor father's, and wished it was his own. It would give him much less trouble than going about selling the golden eggs. The giant, little thinking he was so narrowly observed, reckoned it all up, and then replaced it in the two bags which he tied up very carefully and put beside his chair with his little dog to guard them. At last he fell asleep as before, and snored so loud that Jack compared his noise to the roaring of the sea in a high wind when the tide is coming in. At last Jack, concluding all was secure, stole out in order to carry off the two bags of money. But just as he laid his hand upon one of them, the little dog, which he had not perceived before, started from under the giant's chair and barked most furiously. 
Instead of endeavoring to escape, Jack stood still, thought expecting his enemy to awake every instant. Contrary, however, to his expectation, the giant continued in a sound sleep, and Jack, seeing a piece of meat, threw it to the dog who at once ceased barking and began to devour it. So Jack carried off the bags, one on each shoulder, but they were so heavy, it took him two whole days to descend the beanstalk and get back to his mother's door. When he came, he found the cottage deserted. He ran from one room to another without being able to find anyone. He then hastened into the village, hoping to see some of the neighbors who could inform him where he could find his mother. An old woman at last directed him to a neighboring house where she was ill with a fever. He was greatly shocked at finding her apparently dying and blamed himself bitterly as the cause of it all. However, at the sight of her dear son, the poor woman revived and slowly recovered her health. Jack gave her his two money bags. They had the cottage rebuilt, well furnished and lived happier than they had ever done before. For three years Jack heard no more of the beanstalk, but he could not forget it though he feared making his mother unhappy. It was in vain endeavoring to amuse himself. He became thoughtful and would arise at the first dawn of day and sit looking at the beanstalk for hours together. His mother saw that something preyed upon his mind and endeavored to discover the cause. But Jack knew too well what the consequence would be should she succeed. He did his utmost, therefore, to conquer the great desire he had for another journey up the beanstalk. Finding, however, that his inclination grew too powerful for him, he began to make secret preparations for his journey. He prepared a new disguise, better and more complete than the former, and when summer came, on the longest day, he awoke as soon as it was light, and without telling his mother, ascended the beanstalk. He found the road, journey, etc much as it was on the two former times. He arrived at the giant's mansion in the evening and found the wife standing, as usual, at the door. Jack had disguised himself so completely that she did not appear to have the least recollection of him. However, when he pleaded hunger and poverty in order to gain admittance, he found it very difficult indeed to persuade her. At last he prevailed and was concealed in the copper. When the giant returned, he said furiously, I smell fresh meat. But Jack felt quite composed, since the Jack had said this before and had been soon satisfied. However, the giant started up suddenly, and, notwithstanding all his wife could say, he searched all round the room. While this was going forward, Jack was exceedingly terrified, wishing himself at home a thousand times. But when the giant approached the copper and put his hand upon the lid, Jack thought his death was certain. But nothing happened, for the giant did not take the trouble to lift up the lid, but sat down shortly by the fireside and began to eat his enormous supper. When he had finished, he commanded his wife to fetch down his harp. Jack peeped under the copper lid and saw a most beautiful harp. The giant placed it on the table, said, Play! And it played of its own accord, without anybody touching it, the most exquisite music imaginable. Jack, who was a very good musician, was delighted and more anxious to get this than any other of his enemy's treasures. But the giant, not being particularly fond of music, the harp had only the effect of lulling him to sleep earlier than usual. As for the wife, she had gone to bed as soon as ever she could. As soon as he thought all was safe, Jack got out of the copper and, seizing the harp, was eagerly running off with it. But the harp was enchanted by a fairy, and as soon as it found itself in strange hands, it called out loudly, just as if it had been alive, Master! Master! The giant awoke, started up, and saw Jack scampering away as fast as his legs could carry him. 
Oh, you villain! It is you who have robbed me of my hen and my money bags, and now you are stealing my harp also. Wait till I catch you, and I'll eat you up alive. Very well, try, shouted Jack, who was not a bit afraid, for he saw the giant was so tipsy he could hardly stand, much less run. And he himself had young legs and a clear conscience, which carry a man a long way. So after leading the giant a considerable race, he contrived to be first at the top of the beanstalk, and then scrambled down it as fast as he could, the harp playing all the while the most melancholy music, till he said stop, and it stopped. Arrived at the bottom, he found his mother sitting at her cottage door, weeping silently. Here, mother, don't cry. Just give me a hatchet. Make haste, for he knew there was not a moment to spare. He saw the giant beginning to descend the beanstalk, but the monster was too late. His ill deeds had come to an end. Jack, with his hatchet, cut the beanstalk close off at the root. The giant fell headlong into the garden and was killed on the spot. Instantly, the fairy appeared and explained everything to Jack's mother, begging her to forgive Jack. Who was his father's own son for bravery and generosity, and who would be sure to make her happy for the rest of her days? So all ended well, and nothing was ever more heard or seen of the wonderful beanstalk. End of Jack and the Beanstalk. Chapter Four of Favorite Fairy Tales. Favorite Fairy Tales. The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood. Once there was a royal couple who grieved excessively because they had no children. When at last, after long waiting, the queen presented her husband with a little daughter, His Majesty showed his joy by giving a christening feast so grand that the like of it was never known. He invited all the fairies in the land. There were seven altogether. To stand godmothers to the little princess, hoping that each might bestow on her some good gift, as was the custom of good fairies in those days. After the ceremony, all the guests returned to the palace, where there was set before each fairy godmother a magnificent covered dish with an embroidered table napkin, and a knife and a fork of pure gold studded with diamonds and rubies. But alas! As they placed themselves at table, there entered an old fairy who had never been invited, because more than fifty years since she had left the king's dominion on a tour of pleasure, and had not been heard of until this day. His Majesty, much troubled, desired a cover to be placed for her, but it was of common delve, for he had ordered from his jeweler only seven gold dishes for the seven fairies aforesaid. The elderly fairy thought herself neglected and muttered angry menaces, which were overheard by one of the younger fairies, who chanced to sit beside her. This good godmother, afraid of harm to the pretty baby, hastened to hide herself behind the tapestry in the hall. She did this because she wished all the others to speak first, so that if any ill gift were bestowed on the child, she might be able to counteract it. The six now offered their good wishes, which, unlike most wishes, were sure to come true. The fortunate little princess was to grow up the fairest woman in the world, to have a temper sweet as an angel, to be perfectly graceful and gracious, to sing like a nightingale, to dance like a leaf on a tree, and to possess every accomplishment under the sun. Then the old fairy's turn came. Shaking her head spitefully, she uttered the wish that when the baby grew up into a young lady and learned to spin, she might prick her finger with the spindle and die of the wound. At this terrible prophecy, all the guests shuddered, and some of the more tender-hearted began to weep. The lately happy parents were almost out of their wits with grief. Upon which. The wise young fairy appeared from behind the tapestry, saying cheerfully, "Your Majesties may comfort yourselves. The princess shall not die. I have no power to alter the ill fortune just wished her by my ancient sister. Her finger must be pierced, and she shall then sink, not into the sleep of death, but into a sleep that will last a hundred years. 
After that time is ended, the son of a king will find her, awaken her, and marry her. Immediately, all the fairies vanished. The king, in the hope of avoiding his daughter's doom, issued an edict forbidding all persons to spin and even to have spinning wheels in their houses on pain of instant death. But it was in vain. One day, when she was just fifteen years of age, the king and queen left their daughter alone in one of their castles. When, wandering about at her will, she came to an ancient dungeon tower, climbed to the top of it, and there found a very old woman, so old and deaf that she had never heard of the king's edict, busy with her wheel. "What are you doing, good old woman?" said the princess. "I'm spinning, my pretty child." Ah, how charming! Let me try if I can spin also. She had no sooner taken up the spindle than, being lively and obstinate, she handled it so awkwardly and carelessly that the point pierced her finger. Though it was so small a wound, she fainted away at once and dropped silently down on the floor. The poor, frightened old woman called for help. Shortly came the ladies in waiting, who tried every means to restore their young mistress, but all their care was useless. She lay beautiful as an angel, the color still lingering her lips and cheeks. Her fair bosom softly stirred with her breath. Only her eyes were fast closed. When the king, her father, and the queen, her mother, beheld her thus, the new regret was idle. All had happened as the cruel fairy meant, but they also knew that their daughter would not sleep forever. Though after one hundred years, it was not likely they would either of them behold her awakening. Until that happy hour should arrive, they determined to leave her in repose. They sent away all the physicians and attendants, and themselves sorrowfully laid her upon the bed of embroidery in the most elegant apartment of the palace. There she slept and looked like a sleeping angel still. When this misfortune happened, the kindly young fairy who had saved the princess by changing her sleep of death into the sleep of a hundred years was twelve thousand leagues away in the kingdom of Mataki. But being informed of everything, she arrived speedily in a chariot of fire drawn by dragons. The king was somewhat startled by the sight, but nevertheless went to the door of his palace, and with a mournful countenance presented her his hand to descend. The fairy condoled with his majesty and approved of all he had done. Then, being a fairy of great common sense and foresight, she suggested that the princess, awakening after a hundred years in this ancient castle, might be a good deal embarrassed, especially with a young prince by her side, to find herself alone. Accordingly, without asking anyone's leave, she touched with her magic wand the entire population of the palace, except the king and queen, governess, ladies of honor, waiting maids, gentlemen ushers, cooks, kitchen girls, pages, footmen, down to the horses that were in the stables and the grooms that attended them. She touched each and all. Nay, with kind consideration for the feelings of the princess, she even touched the little fat lap dog Puffy, who had laid himself down beside his mistress on her splendid bed. He, like all the rest, fell fast asleep in a moment. The very spits that were before the kitchen fire ceased turning, and the fire itself went out, and everything became as silent as if it were the middle of the night, or as if the palace were palace of the dead. The king and queen, having kissed their daughter and wept over her a little, but not much, she looked so sweet and content, departed from the castle, giving orders that it was to be approached no more. The command was unnecessary, for in one quarter of an hour there sprung up around it a wood so thick and thorny that neither beasts nor men could attempt to penetrate there. Above this dense mass of forest could only be perceived the top of the high tower where the lovely princess slept. A great many changes happen in a hundred years. The king, who never had a second child, died, and his throne passed into another royal family. So entirely was the story of the poor princess forgotten that when the reigning king's son, being one day out hunting and stopped in the chase by this formidable wood, 
inquired what what it was, and what were those towers which he saw appearing out of the midst of it, no one could answer him. At length, an old peasant was found who remembered having heard his grandfather say to his father that in this tower was a princess, beautiful as the day, who was doomed to sleep there for one hundred years until awakened by a king's son, her destined bridegroom. At this, the young prince, who had the spirit of a hero, determined to find out the truth for himself. Spurred on by both generosity and curiosity, he leaped from his horse and began to force his way through the thick wood. To his amazement, the stiff branches all gave way, and the ugly thorns sheathed themselves of their own accord, and the brambles buried themselves in the earth to let him pass. This done, they closed behind him, allowing none of his suit to follow. But ardent and young, he went boldly on alone. The first thing he saw was enough to smite him with fear. Bodies of men and horses lay extended on the ground, but the men had faces not death white but red as peonies, and beside them were glasses half filled with wine, showing that they had gone to sleep drinking. Next, he entered a large court. Paved with marble, where stood rows of guards presenting arms, but motionless as if cut out of stone. Then he passed through many chambers where gentlemen and ladies, all in the costume of the past century, slept at their ease, some standing, some sitting. The pages were lurking in corners. The ladies of honor were stooping over their embroidery frames, or listening apparently with polite attention to the gentlemen of the court. But all were as silent as statues and as immovable. Their clothes, strange to say, were fresh and new as ever, and not a particle of dust or spider web had gathered over the furniture, though he had not known a broom for a hundred years. Finally, the astonished prince came to an inner chamber where was the fairest sight his eyes had ever beheld. A young girl of wonderful beauty lay asleep on an embroidered bed, and she looked as if she had only just closed her eyes. Trembling, the prince approached and knelt beside her. Some say he kissed her, but as nobody saw it and she never told, we cannot be quite sure of the fact. However, as the end of the enchantment had come, the princess awakened at once, and looking at him with eyes of the tender regard, said drowsily, "Is it you, my prince? I have waited for you very long." Charmed with these words, and still more with the tone in which they were uttered, the prince assured her that he loved her more than his life. Nevertheless, he was the most embarrassed of the two, for thanks to the kind fairy, the princess had plenty of time to dream of him during her century of slumber, while he had never even heard of her till an hour before. For a long time did they sit conversing, and yet had not said half enough. Their only interruption was the little dog Puffy, who had awakened with his mistress, and now began to be exceedingly jealous that the princess did not notice him as much as she was wont to do. Meantime, all the attendants, whose enchantment was also broken, not being in love, were ready to die of hunger after their fast of a hundred years. A lady of honor ventured to intimate that dinner was served, whereupon the prince handed his beloved princess at once to the great hall. She did not wait to dress for dinner, being already perfectly and magnificently attired, though in a fashion somewhat out of date. However, her lover had the politeness not to notice this, nor to remind her that she was dressed exactly like her royal grandmother, whose portrait still hung on the palace walls. During the banquet, a concert took place by the attendant musicians, and considering they had not touched their instruments for a century, they played extremely well. They ended with a wedding march, for that very evening the marriage of the prince and princess was celebrated. And though the bride was nearly one hundred years older than the bridegroom, it is remarkable that the fact would never have been discovered by any one unacquainted therewith. After a few days, they went together out of the castle and enchanted wood, both of which immediately vanished and were never more beheld by mortal eyes. The princess was restored to her ancestral kingdom. 
but it was not generally declared who she was, as during a hundred years people had grown so very much cleverer that nobody then living would ever have believed the story. So nothing was explained, and nobody presumed to ask any questions about her, for ought not a prince be able to marry whomsoever he pleases? Nor, whether or not the day of fairies was over, did the princess ever see anything further of her seven godmothers. She lived a long and happy life, like any other ordinary woman, and died at length, beloved, regretted, but the prince being already no more, perfectly contented. End of the Sleeping Beauty in the Wood chapter.